let's talk about scanning for a second. Now, scanning is obviously a very important step in the process of developing film where you're going to digitize it and bring it into the computer. And this is probably the single thing that I get asked the most about in conjunction with doing this show. And the truth is, and you can see my scanner behind me, I do not have a very fancy scanner. In fact, it's very old. And at some point, I'll have to replace it simply because the software won't be able to keep up because that's getting old too. I've got an Epson 4870, and it's something I'd recommend, not necessarily but scanners aren't like cameras. There's not a new scanner out every six weeks uh, to check out and look at specs on. And most of the affordable options for people, as far as scanners go, are gonna be flatbed scanners. Now we're shooting 35 millimeter film today, and 35 millimeter is not exactly the easiest thing to do on a flatbed scanner. It does create problems sometimes with keeping the film flat, and there are other options available. For me, I know how to get really good scans using the scanner. I'm gonna tell you a little bit of what my secret is to that. So that's why I have not upgraded to something else. I know that there are other options and you guys might look into things like the pack on or even some of the Nikon cool scan stuff that's just built for 35 millimeter if you do a lot of that. I don't do exclusively 35 millimeter and I don't do it enough to justify the cost that it would go in for me to buy an expensive scanner so that's really why I haven't done it. So the flatbed works for me. Um, get something decent. You don't have to spend a lot of money but I'm going to tell you what the secret is to getting good scans. For me it comes down to what the software is doing. Now here's the deal, when you set it up to automatically do scans, um, generally it's going to do things like, uh, you know, and they're going to be digitally, but it's going to do things like sharpen your images, auto crop them, try to fix the levels, and it's kind of like when you go into Photoshop and just hit the auto button and let it do its thing. Sometimes it works, most of the time it doesn't. You're going to want to get more specific. So for me, the key to getting really good scans is to turn as much off in that software as you possibly can. This means I don't use digital ice. Um, generally what I will do is I will go through and I will set the auto exposure to see what it does. Nine times out of 10, the software that comes with this Epson scanner generally tries to overexpose highlights and underexpose shadows. So in essence, the shadows are too dark and the highlights go too bright. Now remember, anything you do on that scan is not something you can undo once you bring it into whatever editor you're using, whether it's Lightroom or Photoshop. So it's really important to scan with as many options as possible. So a lot of times when I bring in my scans, they look a little on the flat side. That's because I wanna be able to go in and do curves adjustments, uh, dirt, dodge and burn, and do all of my light related stuff inside the software myself. And this goes for sharpening as well. A lot of times these things can over sharpen, and if you've over sharpened, there's no way you can get rid of it and it becomes kind of a mess. So that's really the secret, I think, to getting good scans on a scanner, is bringing it in and allowing yourself the most options as possible. Now there's a couple different ways you can scan. You can do it from inside Photoshop. I prefer just to use the standalone app as bad as it is because it will batch scan. So I can get up to 24 exposures on the flatbed at one time and then I'll go in and I'll go ahead and scan all of those. If it's a roll of 36, then I have to do another batch of uh, 12 to get in there, but then that's it and I'm good to go. Um, the only other thing and that I wanna show you in a second because I've started using um, some software from a company called Meta35, which will add metadata into your scans and it's very useful and we'll talk about that in just a second because I think what they're doing is really pretty cool uh, and it adds a lot of functionality if you're shooting film to what you can do when you are scanning. So anyway, when I do that as a second step, what I like to do is have a whole batch of TIFF files that I can use and then I will go in after I've used Meta35 and do some more work in addition to that. Let's talk for just a second about metadata. Now, metadata is something that if you shoot a digital camera, you probably don't think much about because so much of it is automated. When you make an exposure, uh, the camera automatically embeds all that information into the image file. So this could be everything from exposure information. So for instance, what your aperture setting was, what the focal length on the lens was, what the ISO setting was, what shutter speed, whether or not the flash fired. You can even have copyright information in there. You can put GPS data and location information in there. It just depends on how fast fancy your setup is and what you've got going on. Now if you shoot film, this is a little more difficult because there is no way inherently of scanning images and assigning metadata to the images that you've scanned until now. Now one thing I want to preface this by saying is the last show I did my little review of the Nikon F5 and one of the things I mentioned about this camera, and there's a couple other models from several manufacturers that do this as well, but it was very crude at the time, but one thing it did was it kept an internal text file of some basic settings. 
settings. So like focal length of the lens, the aperture, shutter speed, uh, ISO settings. So basic stuff that could be turned into metadata, but what it did is it just saved it as a text file. Now this is stuff that back in the old film days, um, when you were learning as a photographer, a lot of us, or I did anyway, kept a notebook. And when you would go out and learn how to make exposures, particularly when you're using an external meter or something, you would write all that stuff down so you could refer back to it later when you're looking at your pictures. And so anyway, when we caught kind of into that late step of the end of the 35 millimeter camera lines, um, that was something that all of a sudden they were starting to do internally. And of course, when we went to digital, you could embed that into a file and it didn't even matter. Now, one of the things I've started using lately is some software by a company called Meta 35. And when you actually buy the Meta 35 stuff, uh, it comes in this box here, you get, and this is really cool, you get the PCI cable, which will plug into the back of the camera. So this is the PC link. So you plug that in. And the other end of this, this is really interesting too, it's just a little eight inch connection and it goes into a USB terminal and then you plug that into your computer. And so what I wanna do is I wanna show you how I'm using this and how powerful this is if you're interested in converting that text file that's inside the camera into your images. So what we're looking at here is the Meta 35 application interface. And one thing I wanna mention before we start using this that is very important is that the file types that Meta 35 supports are basically JPEG and TIFF files. They do not have support right now at this time for Photoshop PSD files. So the reason I'm mentioning this to you is this is very important that you put this in the right place in your workflow. So typically what I do is I batch scan from the Epson software and I batch scan those into to naming convention and ordered TIFF files. And so what I'll do is I will go in and I will actually batch the TIFF files and then I will take that and then open them as Photoshop files. Now you could conceivably do this at the end of your process as well when you have JPEG files that you're ready to distribute on the internet, but I think most people probably like to keep that Photoshop file, so you need to do these as TIFF files first. So the first thing we're gonna do is we need to import the metadata off the camera, and I'm gonna show you how easy this is to do. All I need to do is plug in the PCI link here, or the PC terminal, and we're going to go ahead and turn the camera on so we get power going there, and I will take the other end and I will just simply plug this into the USB port, and uh, once that's in, I'm going to go into the software here, I'm going to say import data. It's going to connect to the camera, and you can see that our roll of film is imported, or the text file for the roll of film anyway. See it says F5 number 10 up here, and you can see as we scroll down here, um, you can see shutter speeds, f-stop number, and then there's an include yes or no, anyway, as you go through. So anyway, very cool. The next thing I need to do is load my images. So I'm gonna say load images. I'm going to go to my desktop, select this folder, say open and it's going to bring all of my images in uh, it takes just a second to do because I did load TIFF files here we go once the images are in um, you know with my scanner it's fairly foolproof but if for some reason you do have these in the wrong order you can select an image and you can use the move up or move down arrows to resort them um, it really is easier if you have them numbered correctly so it just brings them in automatically and you can also do some basic adjustments with rotation in here but anyway this is what we've done and so the other cool thing you can do is up here where it says films on roll notes you can put notes on the roll of film for some reason if you want to put a location or something like that to help you remember because you can archive all of these into the software and if you need to recall them later for any reason and resync them um, and that'll give you some notes rather than just saying roll number 10 it might clue you in better as to what goes in there now that field doesn't actually go into the metadata of anything but the fields below do so you can see where I have this image selected and you can fill this out so for content um, this is my deep LM test shoot uh, and my description I just put test shoot for the Nikon F5 along with Meta 35 Kodak T-Max 100 Rodinol semi stand so I like being able to put this into the image because one of the things that I like to be able to remember about images later uh, that I have a hard time doing now with my back catalog is I want to remember what developer I used sometimes and what the film type was. And so I used to have a way of putting the film type at least into the naming convention that I used. Um, but anyway, the developer's not in there. So this is a great way to do that using metadata. The other fields you have, you have details in here. You can use keywords to do that. Maybe that's a great place to do that too. So you could go search that later using Bridge or Lightroom or whatever it is you're using. So if you want to search keywords for Rodinol, for instance, I could go do that or semi stand or whatever it is that I want to do. Um, location obviously is in here and then you can put your copyright information in here as well. You can set this as a default so you don't have to type it in each time, which is kind of nice and you can 
tick apply to whole roll and it will apply to the entire roll. So anyway, that is very nice to do. And then when you're ready to sync up your metadata, it's really easy. All you have to do is click here where it says embed data. It's gonna go say backing up images and it's gonna go through and what it's gonna do is going to take that text file and you can see it's thinking and it's going to embed all of that in as metadata into your image files. And it is that easy to use. Um, I'm really impressed with this because you know, this is a really um, challenging thing, I think, for photographers who have a large catalog of film-related images that they're having digitized. And so for me, obviously, developer and film type, for instance, is important to me. It may not be important to somebody else, but if you're a location photographer, location might be important, and that might be something you want to be able to have searchable, or whatever it is you're shooting, portraits, you want people's names in there. So being able to put that into the metadata is very interesting and I think very essential to do. The other thing that's nice is when I upload these to Flickr's that Flickr will extract metadata. I want to take a second and give a shout out to our sponsor today, who are the awesome folks over at audible.com. If you're not familiar with audible.com, they offer over 180,000 downloadable titles of audiobooks across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. So if there's something you're interested in reading or listening to, in this case, Audible probably has you covered. If you're like me and you like to read, but you don't have a lot of time to read, audible.com is a great way. It's a subscription-based service, and basically you get a book a month and it's a great way of passing time at the gym or on a commute or any other place where you'd like to listen to audiobooks. And they have a deal going right now for Art of Photography viewers where you can get your first title absolutely free. What you want to do is head over to audiblepodcast.com slash AOP and start browsing their titles. One I'm working through right now is not exactly the happiest book in the world, but it's excellent. It's a book called Angela's Ashes. You can check that out or anything else they've got. They have a ton of stuff to choose from. Go ahead and sign up for the service and you have 30 days to check it out absolutely free. If you decide Audible is not right for you, no hard feelings, you get to keep the book. And the book is yours 100% for free. So go over there and check it out. Once again, that URL is audiblepodcast.com slash AOP. And I do want to give an extra special thanks to audible.com for once again sponsoring another episode of The Art of Photography. Anyway, I absolutely love Meta 35. Before I shut this down, I want to show you one last thing of how nice this is. So, you know, the way you go through, and I mentioned that these custom settings are a little bit of a pain in the rear end. Um, if I plug this in, because what the deal is, is you need to pull out the cheat sheet and you need to know what number the setting is and then what your options are for that setting. So once I have the camera in, I'm going to go ahead and turn that on as well. If I go over here and click camera setup, this is how easy this is. So it's going to blink for a minute while it talks to the camera and I can go through here, banks and IDs, all functions. I can go in and look at auto function, autofocus functions only, exposure functions only. This makes it really quick and you don't need that cheap sheet and all that scrolling to go in. And as I mentioned when I reviewed the F5, one thing that's nice about the way Nikon did design this camera is that they put most of the stuff in the custom functions. It's not stuff you're necessarily, it's more stuff, it's, it's basically options of how you want the camera set up. So they're not the kind of things you're going to go want to change on the fly a lot. But if you do, then it's really nice to be able to do this. And you can actually save these as presets and reload them to the camera. So if you have the camera set up a certain way for a certain type of shoot like if you're outdoors doing street photography and then you have a different setup that you want to do for night photography and a different setup that you want to do for studio portraits you can actually go save these as presets and it's very cool everything I've tested with this f5 so far has been really impressive and uh, I'm really um, seriously impressed with what meta 35 have done I think they do some really outstanding work and they provide something that is very beneficial if you happen to have one of these cameras um, the only other thing I want to discuss with this is the price point on this because Meta 35 is not the cheapest thing in the world. It's about $150. And what that gets you though is it gets you the cable connector, but you're also getting the software and the ability to do all this stuff. And so really I think for me, um, when you consider if you're the kind of person who shoots a lot of film and you do want this step of at being able to add metadata to your images, I think the $150 is probably worth it. You're going to be able to use it with any of the, I can't remember, it was about seven or eight cameras that, that it's compatible with. Um, and mainly if you're shooting even with one for a long period of time to be able to switch your settings around with the camera set up and be able to add metadata to your images. And then be able to archive those text files that, let's face it, right now probably nobody's doing anything with if you're an F5 or F6 shooter or N90 or whatever it is that you've got, um, to be able to add that into your process and your workflow, I think is a very nice thing to be able to do. So yes, it is a little pricey, but I think on the whole, when you consider what you're getting out of that, 
I think it's probably for some people just as valuable as the camera that they paid for or buying a lens. It's another object in that. And so anyway, uh, their support is excellent. Nice folks. Um, my friend Pete, who is a fan of the show, who I met when I did the Atlanta meetup, um, he has had some experience with this as well. And he had some trouble with the thing talking to the camera. And it turned out it was a cable that needed to be replaced. Meta 35 took care of it. No questions asked. And uh, I think they're just a really good, outstanding company with a very interesting product. So anyway, that's it. And if you guys got any questions on this or have any comments, please leave them below the video. And uh, as always, if you enjoyed this video, please remember to like it and share it with your friends. And as always, subscribe to The Art of Photography so that you'll always be up to date on all the latest and greatest videos we do here. Until the next episode, I'll see you later.